All right, so which one of us answers texts and calls faster than the other? Um, that's a no-brainer. That's you for sure. <laughs> Why would you say that? Because you're on the phone quite a bit and a lot more than I am. Chad deleted his Facebook, so I guess I'm always <laughs> scrolling more than he is. Alyssa, when we have decisions to make in the household, how do we? How do you communicate? Do you open up right away? Do you bottle up? Do you let it sit for a little bit and think? Um, I'm pretty sure I probably open up right away. And maybe sometimes I should think about it more before responding. <laughs> it's probably true. I'm the exact opposite where I probably bottle up and maybe I should open up a little bit. But yeah. I think it depends if I'm driving too. <laughs> You're driving? When, when do you drive? <laughs> <laughs> so Jad, I know we were talking about communication earlier and since having Bronson, how important it is to make sure that we're constantly communicating each other's schedules and opinions on things and making sure that we're on the same page about parenting. Um, what other opinions do you have about communication and how um, we, how our marriage kind of defines that? Well, I think it's been pretty evolving, especially since Bronson's been born. Um, I think for the first probably two weeks to a month when we're just trying to, trying to survive at that point, um, we might have might not have communicated as much as we probably should have to help each other out and um, you know we're, we're pretty tired and you know not not expressing our you know our feelings towards each other but I think that's evolved over the last you know six seven months where it's, it's gotten quite a little better. Yeah I think us both working from home we can find some challenges with our schedule changing daily on maybe voicing that to the other and um, trying to schedule daycare pickups and drop-offs and Sometimes it gets lost in communication, so um, it's something we constantly need to work on. I want to welcome those who are joining us on the live stream this morning, most likely AJ and Megan, as they're out celebrating their 10th anniversary or huddled around their computer screen, you know, making sure everything goes well here today. Um, just a reminder that we want to, uh, uh, we are a community that loves to gather around God's word and we have this thing called a life journal not only is it in hard copy form available in the narthex but it's also available through our app the renewal app that we have on all the various platforms and it's a great way to start out the day uh, just the first five minutes or so beginning with god's word as a foundation um, that is a, a, a great way to uh, uh, to be walking together around scripture in our community and then also some in-house business that I'd like to uh, give a shout out for today. Actually, a, a tremendous gift that uh, has happened in our midst in the last few months of time. Uh, James and John Pelletier, uh, those are those two handsome young men, fine young men. In fact, let's just check and see if they're handsome. Could I have the two of you stand up, please? Could you just stand up? Are those not handsome young men right there? Yeah, yeah. You, you're, you're applauding and you don't even know what they've done. It's, it's, it's going to be uproarious applause any moment now. James and John, two fine young men of our community, also uh, are, have worked towards their eagle uh, rank, the highest rank in uh, scouting uh, in our country. Uh, and both of them did their eagle projects here at Renewal, investing time, talents and a lot of their parents money and also a lot of their parents hair being pulled out in order to accomplish this this facility this community is better because of those two young men right there we want to say thank you for your incredible gift to our community yay good job And you had better find ways to thank your parents. That's all I'm going to say right there. This is our second week talking about Marriage Matters, a sermon series on marriage. And this is dicey. This is dicey because there are those in our midst who, uh, who have struggled with marriage, those who have gone through divorce or divorces, 
There are those in our community who are perhaps even right now hanging on, wondering whether or not they can make it through this. Some who have, have been recently divorced, some who have been divorced for a long time, some who are incredibly lonely, single folks who are going, I just want to find the right person. And so as a community, we approach this topic of marriage matters with an understanding that ultimately this is about God's relationship with us. That whether we are divorced or married or single or widowed or whatever category I could, uh, couldn't think of at the moment, that this is ultimately a picture of the fact that God wants to know us intimately. That God desires for us to be naked physically, emotionally, spiritually, and to take delight in who he's made us to be. This image of marriage in the Bible is an image of a God who passionately pursues us, longs for a relationship with us, longs to communicate with us that our worth and our value have been fully restored in Jesus. There's even a book in the Old Testament, which is an erotic love poem written as a description that as a husband loves a wife and vice versa, so God is passionate about knowing us and giving to us his grace. In premarital counseling, I will ask couples, how many times did your parents talk to you about sex? And generally, the answer is zero to one. I remember that conversation with my dad. My dad sat my twin brother, sat my twin brother and myself down, and he said, um, so, do you guys know about the birds and the bees? And my twin brother responded to my dad, sure, dad, what do you want to know? <laughs> I also asked the question, how many times did your parents sit down with you and talk about communication? And the answer is generally zero to one. And yet communication, common unication, communication is the most important thing we have. The Hebrew word for intimacy, yada, means to listen that we have a God who listens intimately to us. And God invites us in our marriages, but also in all the relationships that we have to open our eyes, to open our heart, to open our lives, and to open our ears, and to listen and to love one another the way that he loves us fully. I'm not sure if you've ever played the uh, uh, this interesting game uh, called Uni. Uh, Uni is a, is a fun game. It's, uh, let me describe it for you. There's different colors of cards and so forth, and there's numbers, and there's some skip cards, and, and Uni is just a fantastic game. And, and when you get to the, down to one card, you hold up that card and you yell out, Uni! How many of you ever played Uni? Well, I'm sorry, what was that? No, don't, don't correct the pastor in public. Yeah, yeah. Uno is the name of the game. That's exactly right. Uno, uni, one. Common unication means with oneness. That, that we have an understanding that when what the other person is thinking and feeling and being in the midst of that common unication. Universe, one word, the universe was created by a God who spoke and created billions of galaxies. And that very same God became one in communication with us by on the cross saying to Telestai, your sins are forgiven. 
The God who creates is also the God who restores. The God who creates is also the God who renews. The God who creates is also the one who reconciles. That the same powerful God who's speaking communicates the world and beyond is the same God who communicates to us that we are forgiven. And so as we talk about communication today, we're going to go to a New Testament passage from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. And Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5 are a picture of God's love for us and how we can respond to that as husband and wife, but also as neighbor, as co-worker, as friend, and even are able to respond to our enemies. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and put on your new self, created after the likeness of God. The apostle is using a very clear image. In your old way of thinking, it's like a garment that you have worn for a really long time, and everyone around you knows that it needs to be washed, and you know it's bad when eventually you catch on that it needs to be washed as well. Put on, take off the old smelly garment, toss it, free throw it, whatever you have to do into the washer, but take it off and put on something new. In our old way of thinking, it's about me. In our old way of thinking, it's about what I want. In our old way of thinking, we are easily offended by everyone in the world, whether we know them or not. In our old way of thinking, what can that person do for me? God invites us to take off the old smelly garment that leaves us isolated because of the stench, but also leaves us isolated from the people around us. And he says, let's put on a brand new garment. Let's put on a new way of thinking and living and being. That's why when we get into an argument with someone, doesn't it always seem to end the same way? The argument that we get into always has to follow what's called the dance of death. And it's almost like the script that we have to live out. And, and so if, if you review the various arguments that you've had with someone in the past, it's going to end the same way because you're approaching it with an old way of thinking and an old way of being rather than trying something new, putting on a new garment. The language that the Apostle Paul is using is actually the garment of righteousness. The language that he's using is this image of putting on a new robe. He goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 5, don't you know that you have been washed? That you, God has presented to you as a radiant church without stain, without wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy in his sight? Without wrinkle, without stain, without blemish, radiant, bright white. Can you think of a garment that somebody might wear that has no stains or wrinkles, that it's bright and it's beautiful, and when they walk down the aisle, everyone stands up and goes, wow. Do you need more help than that? <laughs> what garment am I talking about? So when the bride comes down the aisle, Everybody stands up. Why? The tradition is she's a reminder of the church. She serves as a reminder that the bridegroom Jesus has wrapped her in grace. 
When you look at yourself in the mirror and the old stinky garment, you know what you look like, you know what you smell like. But standing in the forgiveness of God, which is free and full and is yours, you stand without wrinkle or blemish or any other stain along the way. You are wrapped in the radiance of God. That gives us a new way of thinking. It gives us, in the process of communicating, a new way of living and being. Laying aside old garment types of things. Laying aside all falsehood. Getting rid of the lies that the devil, the world, and your sinful nature want to throw at you. Getting aside, casting those off. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. In communication, in God's communication with us, he says, you are now righteous because you have my forgiveness. In the midst of our communications, oftentimes we are so concerned about being right that we forget about being righteous. We catch on to that little detail the little something that somebody says that we want to show, hey, I want to point out how you're wrong, rather than approaching the conversation with this. How do we partner together? How do we work through this? You see, we can be right. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm right. We can be right and never get to righteous. You can win the argument and sleep in the garage. <laughs> but when you approach it from being righteous, you get to right. The end goal isn't just right. The end goal is learning how do we partner together in righteousness, where we give each other grace to grow and to learn with one another that it's not just about correction, it's about how are we moving together as a family. This illustration about baptism, being washed and clothed, that's an amazing public testimony to the goodness of God. Baptism is one of those ways where we say, we're gonna lay aside all falsehood, we're going to speak the truth to one another because we are members of one body. Be angry and yet do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But our baptism is that way, way that we make a public declaration. Those old rules of fighting to win, those are past. The new rules of discussion and communicating so that we can be honest, where we can be physically, emotionally, and spiritually naked one with another as we are with God, that's gonna win the day. We're gonna die to the dance of death. We're gonna die to an old way of thinking that just as Jesus died and he rose again, just as he died on his mission to forgive us our sins and set us free into life everlasting, so we all, <coughs> So we are saying, <coughs> we're saying, we're going to die to that old way of thinking. We're going to put in the grave the need to win and instead partner together. Mary, could you grab me a bottle of water there? <clears throat> I've got two hours left to go, and I don't want to lose it here. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Thanks for jumping to help me there. So in our communications one with another, we're going to bury the old way and put on a new garment and view each other not as enemies in the moment, but rather as people that, where we can partner together. In psychology, there's a term. I'm not really a fan of the term, but I'm just going to use it because it's a term that's out there in the field. 
Um, when I was doing my doctoral work in counseling, uh, one class was dedicated to the amphibic brain. The amphibic brain is a way of thinking that, um, that we came from reptiles, which we did not. This understanding that we still have this sense about us where we're constantly thinking about two things. And this could be true for adolescents, okay? And the two things are danger and food, okay? <laughs> so think about the way a lizard looks. Eyes going in different directions, whatever. Danger. <laughs> and food. <laughs> that when we're in a relationship that is insecure and is struggling, we're constantly looking for danger. We're constantly looking, how am I going to get through this? How, how do I get out of this without getting in trouble? What's the danger? Well, in the relationship that God has with us and Jesus, we're secure. We actually get to speak the truth, even if it points out our wrongs. That a new way of thinking and living as being gives us a whole new way to live our lives, that we can tell the truth. We can actually deal appropriately with our anger. We don't get that blind rage, but understand, you know what, we're upset. This is an opportunity for us to discover something new about one another. And once we get through this, we're going to get through what comes next. That we learn how to build up the body of Christ that what I'm going to say isn't to show that I'm right, but what I'm going to say is actually what's going to help our relationship along the way. It doesn't grieve the Holy Spirit. And that's just a, a really powerful way of saying, God saying, I gave you all this forgiveness. How about using it? I, I gave you enough grace to last you for eternity rather than turning against one another. How about we partner now one with another? That it takes off the old stench of bitterness and clamor and wrath and anger and slander and malice. And instead, because Jesus is kind to us, we can be kind to one another. You see, when we try to engage in communication when we're in those trouble spots, it's like giving the devil a foothold. One uh, rabbi puts it like this. I'm not sure if Rabbi Greg came up with this. There's a number of different att uh, uh, attributes for it. But give Satan an inch and he'll be your ruler. Don't give the devil a foothold. That's a mountain climbing term. When you go back to selfishness and you operate out of anger rather than forgiveness, when you try to forgive from your heart rather than to forgive from God's heart, you're giving the devil a foothold, a place to hang on to your relationship. The devil, the world, and our sinful nature all have one thing in common. They love division. They love to separate us from God's power. They love to separate us from God's forgiveness. They love to separate us from the, most, the greatest gift that we have, unity around the grace of God. It's like that child who's trying to get their parent to pit one, another, one against the other. Don't give the devil a foothold. To put this into practical application, how do we speak to one another the truth and love? Uh, I love this little acronym here, THINK. I'll, uh, I'll call out the letter and then if you could finish a sentence for me. So the T is, is it? The H is? It, the I is? The N is? And the K? Oh, wouldn't that save you from a world of hurt right there? See, this is what the Holy Spirit, which already resides in you, which you already have in full measure, 
You may not be utilizing it. You may not be tapping into it. But I will tell you, God has already filled you up with his Holy Spirit so that you're able to utilize these things. And, and like a, a, a coach who's not going to leave his best player on the bench, so God says, put your best player in the game. In the midst of the conflict and the anger, stop and say, Holy Spirit, we need you here. In fact, you are already here. And hold hands and partner together. Is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind? In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. It's okay to go to bed unresolved. It's not okay to go to bed angry. It's better to lose a night of sleep than to allow an emotion in order to uh, build and build and build over the time. We may go, it'll be better in the morning. It'll be less toxic. But I tell you, it won't be better. Because generally, we marry the opposite when it comes to how we handle conflict. Uh, one person generally needs time to think about what happened. And so when they're angry and they go to bed, they're going to fall asleep. And they're going to rest all night long. But they marry someone who's going to worry about it all night long. So, so what happens is one person is sleeping and the other is plotting their death. That's generally what's going on in that situation. One way to move beyond the anger is allying language. And allying language sounds like this. I know that we're in a rough place right now, but I'm looking forward to working this out together with you. And what's amazing, like a pump that is primed, like the water that begins to move, it washes over the relationship and it creates the energy to get beyond what's going on. And then set a time to go, we're both exhausted. We can't talk about it now, but we're going to work it out together. We promise. Let's get back together again tomorrow at 7 p.m. and let's talk about it. Guys, you had better be walking in the door at 6.59. I'm just letting you know, be walking in the door at 6.59 as we ally together. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It allies in our relationships, not only husband and wife, but in our family and then with our co-workers and so forth in communication. That's God's intent. So that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We're not living in bitterness and wrath. We're not allowing slander and malice and unrighteousness to win, but rather be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving, because that's what God has done to you. God has chosen not to keep a record of your wrongs. Whoa! God now invites us by that same spirit not to keep the record of wrongs against someone else. True story. Absolutely true. Not the kind pastors make, you know, in order to drive a point home. Hold on. But I'm using this to drive a point home. I'm in trouble now. A couple. Um, she was about 81. He was about 85. And they asked to sit down and to do some counseling for their marriage, which I did. And they wanted a pastor, an objective perspective on this situation. This was the situation. They put a little sticky note on the cabinet. He put it on the cabinet, sticky note. And every time she failed to close the back door correctly all the way, she would put a little dash on the sticky note. And every time uh, she reminded him 
to get the blankety blank back door fixed, she would, get, on another sticky note, would keep track of how many times she told him to fix the blankety blank door. And there were two sticky notes there on the kitchen cupboards keeping a track of what was wrong. God does not keep a record of your wrongs. There is one thing God cannot do. He cannot remember the sin that he's already forgiven. And one of the greatest testimonies of God's grace being in our life is when we stop keeping a record of what others have done wrong to us and instead respond to what God has done to make us right with him so that then we can be right with one another. When this chapter wraps up, that's much about relationships, marriage, and beyond, it's going to wrap up and it's going to have as its crescendo the first two verses of chapter 5, which are these. Would you read with me? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. It's a little word play going on here. Therefore, be imitators of God. The New Testament word for that is mimeo. Uh, teachers used to have this device called a mimeograph where they would pour chemicals into this round uh, tub and then the chemicals and then they would put the paper over the top in a mimeograph machine and you'd crank it like this. Okay, show of hands, how many of you have ever seen a mimeograph? Okay, good. Now, how many of you have never seen a mimeograph? Oh, boy. Um, it's what they had before marijuana in Colorado, because you could get high on those fumes. <laughs> Teachers would line up to be the ones who do the mimeograph. Okay. Mimeo, imitate, and watch what it says here, and walk in love. The word mimeo describes a child who would walk around in their mom or dad's shoes pretending to be mom and dad. Be imitators putting on the shoes of God's grace and learning how to imitate what God has done for you with that person so that God has forgiven your words, your faults, your sins. Imitate God in the moment of conflict and forgive from God's heart rather than yours. Let us pray.